it's kind of interesting. The meeting's over, and now you get me. Uh, and, uh, and then after my talk, supposedly, there's a meditation. And they told me they'd start the clock again and give me another 25 minutes. So I'd like to play with this opportunity because you all are here, uh, whoever's left. And let's just take a few moments now and drop in. And I'd like to say that from my perspective, we're not going to have a talk and then a meditation. The entire time will be a meditation, just the way our entire gathering has been a meditation practice. So, and again, I will now ring some invisible bells, so no bells, and let's just drop into wakefulness, embodied wakefulness. Underneath all the stories, all the narratives about how we get there, there's no there, it's just here. You're already here, so can we simply unfold, attend? Befriend silence. And so a sense of us dropping into a space of heartfulness and presencing that uh, is a shared space that we are all co-inhabiting this domain in all its complexity and all its beautiful simplicity right here, right now. And as we sit here, if, if you haven't already, you might uh, privilege, that word has been used a lot and we'll hopefully touch on that a good deal more, but you might privilege the perspective of uh, the body for a moment or two. And see if you can uh, embrace in awareness the carriage of the body, how it is in the pelvis, if you, whether you're sitting or standing, but most of us are sitting. And the dignity of having taken your seat, allowing yourself to be completely available in your fullness to this moment, knowing that in some very real way your life depends on it. You, you wouldn't be here, I'm assuming, if you didn't know that. And maybe not just your life depends on it, but life depends on it. And although formal sitting meditation is not the be-all and end-all of uh, liberation and wakefulness, it's one complete space in which that can emerge in any moment that may already be here in every moment, only we just don't recognize it. And to in some sense, recognize or invite yourself to recognize the implicit embodied dignity in taking a stand in your life in this way by taking your seat, by shifting, if you will, from perpetual doing to a timeless being that might even just simply be one in-breath or half an in-breath or one out breath, or just one mind moment, infinitesimal, an insanely important mind moment. And so just as I didn't ring bells to begin this meditation because it has never begun, and I won't ring any bells to end this meditation because it's never going to end. Life itself is the real meditation practice. 
And it took me decades, uh, you know, in my own trajectory to actually come to realize that because I was a very disciplined person, so you know, once I decide I'm going to meditate every morning, I, I don't need to live in a monastery to do it. I, I the bells inside. And so I wake up early in the morning and just sit and then do yoga. And there have been a number of different moments in which the yoga has come up around MBSR or whatever. Yoga is an incredibly important dimension of this practice. Why? Because we have bodies. It doesn't, not limited to the body, but to understand that there are many, many doors, perhaps, into this one room we call awareness. And all the doorways are incredibly beautiful, but as one great yogi named Bob Dylan said long ago, don't stand in the doorway and admire how wonderful your doorway is. It's just another story. But enter the room. So it took me a very long time to realize that when I take my seat, whenever, wherever, it's actually a radical act of sanity in this world of ours to stop, pause, as Sona so beautifully said, and, and drop, stop and drop. To whatever degree is necessary to drop in not into some cocoon of me that's sheltered and protected from the world, even though we sometimes use the word refuge in association with it. But to uh, open to being fully present, that's a radical act of sanity. And, and what I came to see in my own life is it's a radical act of love. It's not about getting anywhere else or, get, or lowering my stress or improving my self. It's about waking up. It's about liberation from all of the self-constructed and karmic and inherited uh, fetters, it's often the technical term, that imprison us. And then we're always looking for some place else to, for the liberation. <laughs> and, and then we wake up. So the title of this talk, some words got transposed, but uh, where is all this going? And what's love got to do with it? And I just threw in as well, because love takes many, many different forms, a few of them, insight, embodied wisdom, community, got to do with it. And all of those themes have been flowing through this conference. and really powerfully. And I want to acknowledge just right from the start that what was acknowledged from the very beginning when we were welcomed by the Native American elder who actually uh, has inherited this, this world, this land that we are visiting. And ancient wisdoms here. And I also want to honor Kathy Kerr's family members who are here. I, I just absolutely loved Kathy. And um, as you know, I spent one very long, wonderful, wonderful day in her scanner, <laughs> all dressed up in pajamas with, you know, inside this machine that swallows you. We are a community here. You could feel it. I can feel it. I mean, this is part of the love affair. It's not just sitting. I mean, it's like, if this isn't love, I don't know what is. 
And I hope it's not some kind of narcissistic, self, uh, you know, sort of preoccupied, self-absorbed kind of narrative story. Is Norm here? Yes, where is he? He, he took off, yeah, yeah, they had to go back to Toronto. But, but anyway, you, you get the sense, you know, that uh, we need stories and yet we need to be able to hold those stories in awareness with a certain amount of skepticism. Our old uh, Zen teacher, Sung San Sung San, even the Korean Zen master used to say, open your mouth and you're wrong. <laughs> the fact is you don't even need to open your mouth. As soon as you attach to a thought, you're wrong. But that doesn't make the thought a problem. It's the attachment that's the problem. It's the, this, this, the identification, It's sort of like, you know, Second Noble Truth. So we are collectively involved in some kind of love affair that is absolutely profound and that I would say the world is uh, starving for. You all could be investment bankers, have m much better things to do. I need His Holiness's baseball cap so I can actually make eye contact with you, you know, because it's... Um, Reflect on your own life for a minute. I mean, you could be someplace else. You could be doing someplace else. Mind and life depends on volunteers who are way too busy to do any of this. And yet you do it. There's only... Oh, I like this because the, there's no logo, okay? It's like true emptiness. I can see you. So um, we could all be doing something else, but we have found a way to, in some sense, find each other and find meaning in the connectivity and in the Dharma in the biggest of ways. Okay? And I want to emphasize that, you know, the Dharma undergirds the entire thing. If we are not talking about Dharma, we're certainly not talking about mindfulness. If we are not uh, understanding the liberative dimension of any of these doors into the room, then it's just more self-improvement. It's another story that we're gilding, you know, in one way or another and making the doorway wonderful. And then the story of me as a great whatever. And you all know that. And one of the things that I think we've been feeling the entire time we're here is this kind of sense of wonder, awe even, at the fact that here we are, uh, young, middle-aged, elders, and we're nurturing each other and realizing the profound interconnectedness and that we need each other and that we also don't understand each other and we piss each other off and that some of us are unbelievably privileged and, and just completely blind to that, meanwhile going around saying how wise we are and how all-knowing because like there's no end to awareness. And, you know, I, I, I hesitate to sort of point out highlights of this, this time together because there have been nothing but highlights. We need a highlight reel would be the entire thing. But, uh, Trish, your vulnerability is, is your willingness to be real. That's what translates. That's what people will remember. The rest they can get out of your books or whatever, but what translates is the, the trajectory that has led to now in you, okay? Where what could have destroyed you, those kinds of energies of dissipation and just, uh, you know, sort of non-recognition of who you essentially are, you, recognized yourself and in a certain way like we all participate in that recognition and we're doing that for each other constantly I love that that's part of the love of and Norm I mean you know the way he is and then so Sonia I mean it's like 
it's unbelievable how when we're willing to be real, then the Dharma is actually, you don't need to say anything, it just transmits. And let's not forget that the word Dharma means lawfulness. Okay, so there's a certain kind of uh, understanding of the nature of reality, or at least an investigation or interrogation of the nature of reality that we're actually all engaged in. And what um, we are coming to realize is that uh, one size doesn't fit all. And we do, and our models are not necessarily completely inclusive. And some of them really are not only blind, but beyond blind. And then we need to wake up. And one of the reasons, and I just realized it last night in a conversation, uh, was that what I don't know, and I don't know I don't know, can actually be a form of violence. It can be harmful to other people because I operate, <laughs> I operate on the basis of a kind of framework that, of course, I kind of am attached to and believe, or at least don't know any better. And to the degree that I'm causing harm and not mindful of it, how, how mindful can I be? I can't learn that on my own. If I'm blind, I need someone to hold a bloody mirror up or a something and, and say, have you looked at this? So, because I could actually talk for about six hours, I mean, uh, sort of Fidel Castro has nothing on me in terms of <laughs> once I get going on this whole domain. Uh, I actually um, want to ground it in certain ways, but I want to go through it pretty quickly with PowerPoint because I, did, I almost never use PowerPoint. But there are a kind of certain kinds of things that I'd like to uh, note that don't have to do with me, although some of it will seem like it's my story, but they have to do with a we that is global, okay? This is like, uh, the world is not only starving for this, it is dying for this. And if I don't make this point at the end, I'll, I'll make it now and then maybe reiterate it, Every single one of us is an absolutely essential vehicle or vector for this flowering, for this uh, realizing what it means to be human at an, in a time when what's going on with technology, whether it's biotechnology or infotechnology, or the marriage of biotechnology and infotechnology is actually moving in the direction with artificial intelligence and so forth that uh, the days of the homo sapiens sapiens may be numbered because like, I mean, how many of you are wearing glasses? I can't really see, but like, it's probably, you know, a lot of people, okay? He goes, who wouldn't want an upgrade on not being able to see so well? Hmm? Well, what about a memory upgrade? Who would over 50 wouldn't want a little memory upgrade, you know, and implanted so no one could see it. It's just like I just seem to continue to be brilliant in my 70s, my 80s, like, you know, like look at how he pulls on stuff, you know. <laughs> and of course, you can't practice mindfulness, you know, for uh, 50, 60, 70 years without realizing what the toll is over 50, 60, 70 years. I mean, it's like you're mindful of dissipation, disintegration, <laughs> impermanence. I mean, it's like not like in some book, it's like in your face. <laughs> and then, of course, you have to, that's a great yoga in its own right, because then you get to play with uh, fear, not wanting what's going on, building stories around it, how it used to be great, but now it's not so great, and like, you know, it's, and it's so much more painful, or whatever it is, and uh, of course, we know all of that is just kind of the mind proliferating stuff, okay? And again, so I don't forget it later down the road, I'll just say, and I wish Norm were here, because I think the paper, his 2007 paper that, that he's the first author on about uh, mindfulness revealing different modes of self-referencing, 
uh, you know, is a Nobel Prize winning paper, it just without one paper. I mean, it's like, because that's what psychology is about, is understanding the nature of self, and nobody, nobody writes about or investigates the nature of self, especially the empty or insubstantial, continually changing aspects of what we call self that are not actually anywhere near adequate to describing what it means to be human. So Homo sapiens sapiens, before we actually end the species, maybe we should discover what we are in our fullness. And we have not gotten there. The Linnaeus named it Homo sapiens sapiens, the species that is aware from the Latin sapere, which means to taste and to know, that is aware and knows that it's aware. It's not cognition and metacognition. It's awareness and meta-awareness. So that is itself a deep insight and audacious claim. I would say our work is to live our way into it before we get those upgrades that may turn out to not be upgrades. They may turn out to be downgrades. And I'm not anti-technology. It's not like I'm being Luddite here. I'm just saying this is, in some sense, a, 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 what they call a tipping point on the planet without, I don't mean to exaggerate it or sort of like, you know, sort of, but we have the potential to actually wake up or whatever the alternative to waking up is, you can see it in all the dystopic stuff that's going on. And I mean, in the using and theming and the othering and the harm that comes from that. And I mean, just in public discourse, never, never mind uh, encounters with the police or with the authorities or with immigration or with, you know, and not just in this country, but in many countries. So you're getting this uprising out of fear of authoritarianism, of you know, imposing Ussing and theming on people because we don't feel safe. We're one species. At a 2002 meeting of Mind and Life with His Holiness, uh, I remember Eric uh, Lander uh, give it, showing a slide that shows that like uh, the tallest Bantu warrior in Africa and the shortest champion jockey at the Kentucky Derby, their DNA is 99.9% .9 the same. We focus on the 1%, the differences. And we don't recognize the humanity in the other unless the other looks like us. This is insane. This is like patently insane. But when we fall into fear, the othering actually winds up being dehumanizing. And we know that it's like Stanford students can turn into Auschwitz guards. It's not just like something about Germans. It's something about humans. So we have to own that in ourselves. It's not like, well, everybody else might be that way, but I, I could never do that. Uh, the self is a kind of illusory kind of beast, but the, the, anybody who says, well, I've transcended the self, and I've heard some people say that, it's like, <sighs> <laughs> I have two impulses that come up. One, one is a more gentle, and it's just saying, and who is that that's claiming that? Who is the I that's claiming that I have transcended? The other, I had this very strong impulse when this was said to me a very long time ago, was to pick up the chair I was sitting on, bash the person over the head with it, and say, how about that? <laughs> Just as a laboratory test. <laughs> so, oh, OK. You've probably all seen this uh, graph. You may not have seen it for, well, I guess you've seen it for, uh, 2017, uh, we haven't pulled it together for 2018 yet because uh, we need to wait to the end of 2018. But this is a, a graph that uh, David Black and I worked on the format of for many, many years and how to, and it's a very sort of a tight uh, selection process. So it's very s sort of rigorous, like what would get you into a scientific paper in this graph. And as you can see, uh, it's, um, it's really about the year 2000, 2001, 2002, starts to go exponential. I mean, there's a long sub-threshold there, but then it starts to go exponential. And the reason I'm showing it to you is two things. One is, we actually found that it's basically the same for 2017 and 2016. So nothing stays exponential forever. So the question is, is it actually leveling off? 
It has to level off sometime, but we don't know when, okay? And, uh, and again, there's also the question of how much of this is garbage? <laughs> and what, what I, wa I wanna, don't wanna go into that kind of sort of uh, analysis of that, except to say that my intuition is that the studies are getting more and more rigorous, better and better, more and more refined, but we still may be blind to other categories that we're not even paying attention to. And people feel a certain violence from the kind of dominance, as I'm learning, of the sort of scientific arrogance that by definition, like because we're scientists, we're like, you know, we really understand and everybody else doesn't understand. And we decide what's important enough to get, apply to NIH to get grants on. And it's a kind of, you know, it's like a, to some degree, what does our president call it? It's a rigged, the system is rigged. <laughs> and if you're a beneficiary of the rigged system, it seems like, hey, this is not rigged, this is fantastic. You know, because like, it took us 2,000 years to get to this. A science of meditation, I mean, that, and His Holiness has been so instrumental in that, bringing the world, the, the, let's call it the stream of the river of Dharma and contemplative practice, together with the river of rigorous, at its best, scientific investigation, bringing those minds together. That's what Mind and Life does. And yet, we need to ask, what are we not seeing? What are we not even seeing we're not seeing? And why are we not asking those questions? And then why are we like, uh, not pushing NIH more? And not just on this sense of social inclusion, but I would say also on the sense of like, sometimes self-censoring around the language you use so that your, so that your uh, application, your grant application, will sort of be within the sort of uh, uh, normative range to not push the reviewer's button so much that they'll just throw in the garbage. But there are elements of this, and I, one of the things, and we, we've been having conversations about it, uh, is um, the question of whether we can actually use the word state associated with mindfulness. Everybody does it, but I want to at least question it. Because from a, the point of view of a meditation teacher, if you actually reify in other people's minds that we're now going to achieve, attain, uh, move towards the mindful state, you've, excuse my putting it this way, you've fucked it from the very beginning. <laughs> it's just an opinion, okay? It's not the truth. But I, but I think we need to actually be a little bit more uh, and, and also, I don't think necessarily um, treatment manuals, I'm glad Zindel's gone, but treatment manuals, <laughs> which is NIH's gold standard, are necessarily the thing because then it gives the impression that all you need to do is read the book if you have a PhD in this or that. You read the book and then you're a competent mindfulness teacher. And this is one of the biggest problems, I think, not just with psychology, but uh, this is too precious to screw up, folks, in the next 10 or 20 years. It is too precious for us to forget the Dharma roots of this. And that this is hard. The, the, the meditation practice is like, you know, it's a lifetime's work. And it may sound like a love affair. Great, I'll sign up. But then after, you know, your first feeling of like, I'm not getting enough love, like you abandon it. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's not that kind of love. It's tough love. And it requires exercising a muscle across at least, let's say, one lifetime. And as far as I can see, it just gets more and more profound. And it's never about me. It's always about we. Why? Because the first thing that you recognize is interconnectedness. And once you recognize the interconnectedness of life and of beings and, and of how much more we are the same than different, then the only place to step into is compassion, into seeing self in other, self in quotation marks, into recognizing what we don't know we don't know and just leaving a lot of room for it. We don't have to even find out what it is. We just like leave room and then learn learn from other people. And I use that verb, 
to learn in describing what we do in MBSR. The trajectory as I see it involves learning. You walk into a room, you don't know anything about mindfulness, you never even thought to attend to your breath, never mind the body as a whole sitting and breathing or walking or lying down. And out of that, you connect with, let's say, relatively speaking, you connect with something in yourself. You know, you, you have a, a novel experience. Why? Because you actually showed up for yourself without a big overlay of expectation. If it's skillfully taught, it's definitely without a big overlay of expectation, but at the same time, enough expectation so that people will come back. So that's an art form. And then you actually discover that uh, there's a whole universe inside of each moment. And it can be inhabited. And that you f feel OK. You recognize that in this moment, my awareness, if I am embracing even pain or suffering or despair or anger or fear, that you can interrogate your, yourself, investigate for yourself. It's not like someone else is teaching this to you. Investigate for yourself. Is my awareness of my fear afraid? Take, just take a peek, you know, for a second. So all of these, you know, so, so, so the, the, the course of MBSR, so to speak, is an invitation to actually discover some elements of what it means to be human in the form of you and to recognize you're not your diagnosis because almost everybody we see has a diagnosis. But I never read the medical diagnoses. I just want to meet the human. And then, you know, that doesn't mean we ignore what's going, what's wrong with people, but what we're focused on is what's right with people. So moving right along so that uh, we're not here forever. Oh, I just, uh, um, this was like in 1990, the meeting that was mentioned the other day, and uh, uh, my first encounter with His Holiness and, and uh, talking about um, MBSR. And then this is just a kind of study in aging that uh, you'll, you'll notice he doesn't look any different, but <laughs> <laughs> Mathieu doesn't look any different. Maybe it's the uh, baldness, you know, the sort of shaved head. But, uh, but basically that We've been in conversation for a long time on the interface of dharma and dharma wisdom, embodied dharma wisdom and compassion, and medicine. And just to remind you, the words medicine, meditation, same deep root meaning. And this is spreading in very interesting ways. The Democrats now control the House again. Tim Ryan got reelected for the ninth time, I think. Can you imagine having to go up for reelection every two years? I mean, how would you ever get any work done? I mean, you know, even grants, like, you know, it's like, hopefully it's not every two years. <laughs> Um, but, you know, this is filtering out into the society, and some people will say, well, that's a bad thing, you know, we need to keep it within the uh, confines of people who really practice, you know, the Zen temples or the whatever it is. And it's like, you know, and people often blame me for the whole thing. I mean, they say, like, <laughs> you did it, you betrayed the Dharma, you put it out there, it's like spread everywhere, and it's like your fault, and you will burn in some circle of hell for it. And, and I've held that for quite a while. And then something came to me, and I realized, it's going to sound funny to say, but I'll say it just because it sounds funny. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> the Dharma did it. The Dharma is like energy that just cannot be contained. It's going to spill out. And maybe it took, uh, you know, 2,500 years or 2,600 years, but it's, it's like it's got its own love for humanity, not for Buddhists, for humans. I'm quoting His Holiness here, or at least sort of modifying a quote from His Holiness. And, and so, you know, and we're all part of it. I mean, this is a conspiracy because we're breathing together and we're aware of that. Uh, but it's an it's, it's a, it's a entirely healthy conspiring to 
reconnect with what's deepest and best and most beautiful in ourselves while we have the chance. And there's a certain kind of agency, urgency to it because we are stone age underdeveloped minds with nuclear weapons and all sorts of other ways of dysregulating the, uh, the biocycles and the geocycles of the planet itself. We've already managed to give and then this brings up the whole question about truth and truthiness and how much that's real and if you don't want to believe it, well, then it's not true. And so, like, you know, the Dharma is based on lawfulness. Lawfulness, whether it's in science or whether it's in Dharma, you test it. You put it to the test. And if you get a result, then it may be a relative result because you have to test it a thousand different ways. But, you know, in 2015, I think, or 16, this 100th anniversary of Einstein's general theory of relativity, they had by then built and put online two, uh, they call them observatories, but they're not using light, two the biggest vacuums in the world, vacuum tubes or, or vacuum thermos bottles in the world, uh, to actually measure uh, gravitational waves, which he predicted in 1915. 2015, millions, billions of dollars spent on these observatories, 2,000 miles apart, and they can feel the universe from what? Well, they can actually tell you, and it's from colliding black holes billions of years ago, and they can tell you one with 60,000 suns worth of you know, mass, and the other 92,000 suns worth of mass. And these, the universe is doing this constantly, if you get sensitive enough equipment. So there is a certain kind of lawfulness in the universe, and the Dharma is a part of that. It's not separate. It's not some kind of quaint, you know, you know, sort of tradition from mountainous regions of South Asia. It's, so we need to actually stand up in what we understand to be true. And I love that in this, in this gathering, everybody is standing up for their truth. And our truths are different. But there's a certain agreement that we have to at least listen to each other and maybe expand how we understand the notion of uh, the nature of reality by listening. So then one of the ways in which this is expanded is into the parliament in the UK. And I, I know some of you have already been there and participated and hope many of you more go and you probably get invitations, some of you. But, and in France, in the Assemblée Nationale now, they're teaching mindfulness to the, you know, in the legislature. And, it's spreading around the world to legislatures around the world. Now, I don't have a lot of faith in legislators, to tell you the truth. But I have a little more faith in them if they at least are interested in interrogating their own assumptions and their own motivations, since they're actually running the world. And if you read the mindfulness, this, which, so they stole the title from Tim Ryan. They called it a Mindful Nation UK. If you read this document, it is really quite revealing how committed they are. So, so also now I want to bring up China, uh, because China is a kind of area of like a Chinese word for it would be a sensitive area. You know, if you go to China, they have lots of sensitive areas. You don't talk about them. One of them, of course, is His Holiness. Um, but Chinese are human beings. And, you know, governments are governments, and they come and they go. Uh, but this is just a photograph of uh, 300 health professionals and army health professionals and other people from the People's Liberation Army gathered for one of, like we do this almost annually, uh, seven-day MBSR professional training programs. And it is like on fire. China's on fire around mindfulness. And I like to say when I'm there, like, uh, you know, I have to tell you, MBSR is like much more Chinese than it is American. I mean, it's like a, you have a 1,500-year history of Dharma that you don't know anything about. And that, you know, pristine, profound Chan tradition. And then that on top of four more thousands of years of Taoism, imagine if China got back in touch with its Dharma roots. And now we know what China has done in Tibet and is doing in Tibet and what it's doing to the uh, Muslim populations there, imprisoning them and everything else. 
we have to live with uh, you know, what we've got in the United States. So th what I'm trying to do in some tiny little way is simply interface where I can with possibility. Now, in China, for it to get back in touch with its Dharma roots, it would be phenomenal for the Tibet. Because all of a sudden, it would like wake up and realize, holy smoly, holy cow. The gift, the recognition, the embrace, the waking up would be phenomenal. That is a very, very low probability event. But it is a very, very high impact event. So what I'm saying is that, and I know Jack and Trudy have been to China and other people have been teaching in China. I think we need to sort of not fall into dualisms around using and theming or who's in power now and so we can't really do this, but to like, we own the planet. And when we take responsibility for it without that sort of ego overlay, like I own the planet, but or what does that mean? It means that we need to tend it. We need to tend it with tenderness. We need to care. I'm a grandfather now. I care a thousand times more than I did before I was a grandfather. Because of what? Love. It's as simple as that. It's like, you know. And so, and then, you know, the, uh, this is Anderson Cooper, for those of you who don't know him, from uh, CNN, one of the sort of premier journalists on CNN, which is attacked a thousand times a day by our president, by the way. CNN is like, you know, it's like, he's not shy about just like, you, you're like scum, you know? I mean, he's like, he comes up with all these unbelievable words for describing, you know, the first state of, you know, the sort of the United States, one of our ball cords against uh, tyranny. And uh, a retreat with Anderson Cooper that he, he attended one of our retreats, uh, it, it changed his life. He's not shy about saying that. And now he holds down this conference we have every year called Mindfulness in America. I mean, can you believe it? So Mindfulness in America, that's like 15 years ago, that would have been inconceivable. It's happened. 15, 20, 30 years ago, when I started 40 years ago, the idea that the NIH would be funding tens if not 20 millions of dollars of research on mindfulness meditation, that was like less, more improbable than that the big bang that started the entire universe would all of a sudden grind to a halt and then collapse back on itself. <laughs> Very improbable event. It happened, it's already happened, the culture is already different, and if you want the culture to be more different, I'm talking to the scientists now, that's your responsibility. If there are doctors in the room, this is one, if you want medicine to be different, make it different. Don't say, who am I to make it different? <laughs> and so now you can walk into storefronts in New York City and, and meditate on your way to work. I mean, and some people say, well, this is just bullshit, it's just hype, it's whatever. But it's happening, and so the question is, can we tune these things? Can they self-tune so that it's not just sort of a superficial, we'll feel good, but an invitation to actually walk in the door of your own heart and discover that it's boundless. And this is all ethical. Sometimes people say, well, MBSR has thrown out SELA, you know, it's thrown out ethics and stuff like that. Hey, we, and this is a tricky subject because medicine is, has not always been ethical. I mean, there were the, like, you know, Mengele and the German medicine in the concentration camps and the um, Indian, health, Indian Health Service perpetuating horror, you know, for decades, you know, almost a century. So it's not all a pretty picture. Nevertheless, in theory at least, and we can embody it as best we can, those of us who work in medicine and healthcare, uh, the Hippocratic Oath is not something nice thing you get a little sort of uh, parchment at graduation. The Hippocratic Oath is like the, the foundation of all medicines, first do no harm. And here, and, and you know, so that's nice, but if you weren't mindful, how would you even know you were doing harm? We have got to exercise the muscle to cultivate the ability to be mindful so that we even know when we're doing harm because we so much don't even know what we don't know. 
And we have the doubt there. The great doubt, as the Zen people like to say, is like, that's not a problem, that's like a gift. And it's not dissimilar in some way from the Bodhisattva vow. I don't want to equate them, but you know, the Bodhisattva vow, you're setting yourself an impossible standard. I'm gonna save all beings, never mind humans, all beings from suffering. And feature that in, above my own liberation. Just the intention to do that is liberative, especially if you repeat it, exercise the muscle. So this is from, you know, in the wounds of separation that, you know, we can feel in this room. We all carry that. We all carry wounds of non-belonging or not being seen or not being recognized or whatever. A human being is a part of the whole called by us universe. This is Einstein speaking, one of the greatest yogis of all time, although he too, let's not glorify him. He had his problems and, you know, you wouldn't want to be his either wife or child. A human being is a part of the whole called by us universe. This is, you know, a part limited in time and space. He was the one that transformed our understanding of time and space. He, or you can say she or they, experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to include, to embrace all living creatures, all living creatures, sentient beings, and the whole nature in its beauty. And then he says, and I love this, nobody is able to achieve this completely. I don't know how he knew that, but, you know, to a first approximation, let's, let's entertain that that may be true, that you know, uh, nobody's able to attain it completely, but the, but the striving, the, the, the intention for such attainment is in itself a part of, then he uses the word liberation and a foundation for inner security. This needs to be universalized. I mean, this is like, you know, uh, in the same way as we need to universalize the respect for facts and its rigor and putting things to the test and then not just believing it because we've developed some fantasy or story a la norm uh, where like that's great, you know, but, but to actually not know and to know that we don't know. And that's a meditation practice. So the implications for social justice, I would just want to say a few things about it because it's come up so much. Like uh, MBSR didn't happen out of a vacuum. And so I want to tell you something that I hardly ever tell any, anybody. Uh, I'm not sure why, but it never seemed relevant. Now it seems all totally relevant is that when I was at MIT, it was in the middle of the Vietnam War and I personally took, I took it personally that we were bombing an Asian, small Asian country without an air force. I just took it personally. And the Gulf of Tonkin was so obviously fabricated, to use a technical Buddhist term, that we went to war for reasons that were like, you know, and then of course we did it in Iraq too. You know, if you watch Colin Powell, who was the only person possibly in the Nixon administration that might have had some integrity and then lie systematically on television to the United Nations about weapons of mass destruction, the evidence for it. It's like, so this is the universe we live in, whether you live in Russia, whether you live in China, whether you live in the United States, whether you live in Guatemala. I mean, the suffering and the forms of ignorance and greed and hatred and delusion are like, wow, it's like, it's like rampant. And it's always been this way. It's not all Donald Trump's fault. But we need to take responsibility for how we're going to be in wise relationship to it, which is my understanding of what the meditation practice is in the first place. How are you going to be in relationship with human experience? And Francisco Varela was unbelievably powerful in pounding that point over and over again. And if you haven't read The Embodied Mind with Francisco, you know, that Francisco wrote with uh, Evan Thompson and Eleanor Roche, read it. Uh, of course, you won't understand it. You have to read it like a hundred times. You still won't understand it, but maybe you'll get some 
that I'm speaking for myself, some element of it at least where, you know, it's like, it's a transmission be outside the sutras, let's put it that way. So when I was at MIT, I was very involved and took very personally again that uh, MIT, I knew the people were doing it, designing weapons of mass destruction and delivery systems for them. I knew the person, Doc Draper of Draper Laboratories, who developed inertial guidance systems. I'm, I knew him personally. He invited me to go flying with him, which I said, I'm sorry, I'm not getting in the same airplane with you. So, and then people were very scared of us as organized students, graduate students, and the undergraduates were even scarier to the faculty and the administration. This is 1969, because the undergraduates were just burn the place down. And the graduate students, maybe that's not the wisest thing to do. But the professors and, and the administrators would say to us, because don't forget, we're talking now about not just privilege, but elite at the highest level, MIT. MIT, it's like, and they say, why don't you do something constructive? Why don't you do something useful? Why do you always want to destroy? Because they thought we just wanted to burn the place down. We didn't want to burn the place down. We wanted it to undergo what I called, on purpose because I was at MIT, an orthogonal rotation in consciousness, because they love words like orthogonal, you know. <laughs> So everything's the same as it was the moment before, except nothing's the same because you've rotated in consciousness. You've woken up. And so uh, we tried to uh, wake up MIT in various ways. So this is a picture of uh, Jean Genet that they asked me to be the translator for Jean Genet. Uh, and he was sponsored to come to the United States by the Black Panthers. And I knew the Black Panthers, and so we all, you know, we're on stage at MIT one night. I mean, you have to be there to believe it. That's why I'm showing you the photograph. It's like, <laughs> what? That doesn't compute. But I, what I'm trying to say is this kind of social justice thing for me goes back a, a long way. And, you know, and I remember the days of uh, the, the sort of what was going on then. It makes now look like nothing. I mean, you know, there were like, you know, army in the streets, police in the streets. I mean, it was like pretty amazing. And then, you know, uh, Angela Davis and I were invited to do a benefit for the East Bay Meditation Center in uh, 2015. What's the use of mindfulness in a socially unjust world? Okay. So there are all these threads. It's like I started MBSR because of what those professors said, why don't you do something constructive? So I meditated for 10 years on what I, I might do that would be constructive. And what came up was, why not bring what Jack was doing and, and his colleagues inside of meditation centers into the hospital? Because like hospitals are dukkha magnets. I mean, like, you know, nobody goes to the hospital on Saturday night unless they're shot first. So they're dukkha magnets. What better place to offer dukkha dharma, you know? What, uh, the antidote to dukkha. And of course, the physicians and everybody else, the nurses and psychologists, everybody's suffering from dharma. It's an equal opportunity from dukkha. It's an equal opportunity destroyer. OK? So first noble truth. And it's not that life is suffering. Just We all know this. but. You know, you have to be clear about these things because it's so badly translated, life is suffering. It's that there is suffering. It's a diagnosis. And the whole Four Noble Truths is in the form of a diagnosis, ideology, you know, sort of prognosis and treatment plan. Eightfold Noble Path. And then George Mumford, who worked with us in the inner city for years, demonstrating that we could bring this into the inner city for people who are like at the absolute bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, and that they would be able to find meaning in non-doing. And they did. And we actually published a paper like 20 years after we actually wrote the paper. Uh, it took that long to get it published but uh, with the results of that study. But then George has gone on and uh, you know, sort of worked with athletes. And uh, these are some of the athletes that he's worked with. You know? Michael Jordan, like the greatest basketball player of all time. He practiced in mindfulness. Kobe Bryant, right up there in the Pantheon, is practicing mindfulness. And not just now that they're retired, they still practice. 
LeBron, for those of you who don't know who LeBron James is, I mean, and uh, Steph Curry, okay, of the Warriors, you know, the sort of winningest basketball. This is the NBA, so you could say this is total bullshit, you know, I mean, like, you know, how to degrade the Dharma. <laughs> and it could be, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a kind of study without a uh, control group but it's a kind of pouring out, and the, wh why, is, uh, why are the uh, warriors, the Golden State Warriors practicing mindfulness? Because uh, Steve Kerr was a player on the Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan. Maybe the only white guy, I don't remember, short, you know, relatively short white guy, and now he's the coach of the, and it changed his life. It changed Anderson Cooper's life, and he was on such a tight schedule, he only could stay one day for the retreat. One day changed his life. This is powerful stuff. I don't have to tell you, but, I want, but I'm trying to remind you in a certain way, because if we're recognizing our humanity in each other, then why shouldn't basketball players be doing it? And, and do you know how inspiring this is to kids in the inner city? I mean, they could look at me sitting, <laughs> even without the hat, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's really inspiring. I'll go and do that. <laughs> but, you know, if, if there are role models that you look up to that are practicing non-doing, all of a sudden you realize, like, hey. And this is spilling. I mean, it's, in education, it's coming up through the floorboards. Why? It's complicated, but you know, when I went to the New York public schools, I mean, actually, the teachers taught and we pretty much learned. Now it's, and, and of course, it was extremely violent and scary. And so you had to learn how to deal with the violence and scariness. And, and I'm just an N of one, so, you know. But now the schools are in such disarray that teachers can't teach. And so they're starving for mindfulness. They're like dying for mindfulness. They don't stay in the profession that long. And then these practices come along that actually suggest that, hey, all these kids are here for learning. I didn't finish what I said before. Learning in MBSR goes on from learning to growing. You can't learn without growing. As you grow, you grow in an num infinite number of different ways, and that leads to what I call healing, which means accepting things as they are. That's coming to terms with things as they are. That's what my working definition of healing is. And as soon as you accept things as they are, whatever that means that you accept them as they are, all of a sudden there's a transformation, a mini transformation at least, but it's like powerful if you've never had one before. And then they build because you keep practicing. So. Um, with teachers, why not teach kids to tune the instrument of learning before you give them some curriculum that they can't handle? And why not bring embodiment into the whole thing and everything that you've been doing so beautifully and, you know, and that the Louisville public school system now doing this at that level? I mean, and that's, by the way, the, the home of uh, Muhammad Ali. His picture is all over Louisville. Uh, this is how it grounds itself in Homo sapiens sapiens. We may not always think it's, you know, the best practice or that it's like maybe a little trivial or frivolous, but who, you, we don't know. The fact that you're in this room, everything mitigated against it. If you think about when you first came in touch with the Dharma and what would you like before you started meditating and so forth, the odds that you would be here is like almost infinitesimal, but you're here. That's the power of karma. When you begin to attend and you wake up, then your universe expands. So that's tuning a certain kind of instrument, you're already different. And I've seen it. I've visited the schools in Oakland and New York City where the kids in first grade are, you know, and, and even when half the class has ADD or ADHD, they're sitting in a sort of pristine silence and stillness it's hard to believe, but then they learn that, they grow from that, they heal, they deal with the trauma that's you know, sort of so rampant because children are, and then uh, just to say, Erica Sabina is here or was, 
uh, and she's been working for years at Johns Hopkins studying mindfulness in the public schools in Baltimore. And Baltimore is just one of our cities, I don't have to tell you, that has, you know, being pulled apart by racial, racial violence and so forth. And then I just want to mention for Dave uh, Vago's sake, uh, this uh, wonderful teacher that I came in touch with who's now, uh, who unfortunately and very sadly died, Ms. Cherry Hamrick, and she introduced mindfulness after taking an MBSR course in 1990 or something like that at the uh, Latter-day Saints Hospital, LDS Hospital in Salt Lake City. And she said, she asked my advice, I think I should bring mindfulness into the classroom. And I said, don't do it, they'll, they'll string you up, you know, and they'll think you're trying to turn all their Mormon children into Buddhists. But like any good student, she didn't listen to her teacher, she did it. And um, here are kids doing a body scan and sitting meditation. And I mean, she integrated the entire curriculum into mindfulness. She was a, a total genius. Here they're eating one eighth of a candy bar instead of a raisin. <laughs> Walking meditation in the schoolyard. And now um, there is a team at, uh, in Utah and Vanderbilt that is actually, and has published some papers and is working on more, that's gathered data, including follow-up data from these kids 15 or 20 years later. This was in uh, the early 90s. So we have a kind of natural experiment on whether this makes a difference when kids become adults. And from what Dave tells me, there's a signal there, although it's very, you know, there's a lot of challenges, but I just want to bow to you for your willingness to sort of like stay in there as best you can, because it was uh, such a, a, a radical act. Now everybody's doing mindfulness. Life. She was the first one, as far as I know. And she, uh, she died suddenly at age 45 of a heart attack, and it's just like, uh, and I don't think we even need to mention this except to say that mindfulness has kind of moved into integrative medicine in a way that's uh, changed things uh, in that field. And that you, we could even think of mindfulness as good medicine in a certain way. Uh, and preventive medicine, for sure. If you started to take care of your body when you were young or when you learn it in the fifth grade, in first grade or whatever, uh, that's going to make a huge difference in your trajectory and also in your social relationships because, you know, the divorce rate is 50% in, in this country and in many countries. I mean, it's like we need to sort of interrogate wh why we, you know, so many relationships fail. It's because we, what we're missing is the relationship with ourself. What if that were taught in elementary school? So there's huge challenges here uh, facing us. I'd also like to now take a moment after having gone through those, to just, um, first of all, recognize that when I picked up the paper when I got here, it turns out there was a shooting in, in, in uh, a restaurant in, in California, another shooting, and the headline in the paper said like something like 317 mass shootings in the United States in the past 328 days. So that's like... It's almost a mass shooting, not just a you know, murder, but a mass shooting in this country every day. If we're taking responsibility for the body, I think it's time for us to take responsibility, or long over time for us to take responsibility for the body politic. And for what is going on, what is the dis-ease leading to, frank, outrageous disease that can perpetuate this kind of horror on children and teachers in what needs to be the safest and the most nurtured environment on earth that take care of the learning, growing process with our children. So we need, we need to actually recognize, and that's why I guess my final suggestion to you would be that Nobody's here by accident, as I said. And that the world needs absolutely every single one of us. You can't lay it on Matthew Ricard or Jimpa or who, you, you, the world needs every single one of us to actually ask ourselves, as I'm sure you do, but we could do it more. What's called for now? What is my, what is, what is my karma in relationship to all of this? 
And if it's learning how to be in relationship to things you didn't even know you were in relationship and causing harm, then learn that. It's a good place to start. And let that be a love affair, not like, oh, I have to do it because I need to be socially responsible now, what a drag. <laughs> but because we're taking care of the body, and we're taking care of the body, not of the United States of America, of the planet. And so mindfulness of global warming, now that we have the instrumentation to sense what's going on with the sort of the natural weather patterns and the, even the Gulf Stream and so forth, all of which, if you push them into chaotic processes, uh, we could turn planet Earth into Venus. And it'd be people who would deny it all the way all the way to their death. But my suggestion is that what mind and life seems to be about is the recognition of our deep humanity. The recognition that ethics is not some kind of add-on or skin graft, that that's the absolutely fundamental calling of us human beings is to recognize how much each of us is capable of causing harm and then give ourselves a kind of gift of uh, intending to do no harm, or to first do no harm, be above and beyond everything else, or to minimize the harm, because it's probably impossible to do no harm, but to do as little harm as possible, to recognize that when we do do harm, then work to undo it, and to work together at that. So it's not like, oh my God, what a drag, I pulled that card, now I have to not harm anybody. But no, all of us together have to actually participate in this love affair with what it means to be human in the briefest of moments we have, called the human lifespan, to sort of show up. And you know as well as I do that you can pr move through your entire life and then wake up at the end and realize, oh my God, I missed the whole thing. I got the whole thing wrong. So I like to say, uh, and again, going back to yoga and the corpse pose, you know, lying in bed in the morning, that's a fantastic place to meditate. If you have trouble motivating yourself to meditate, when you wake up, finish the job in the morning. Don't even get out of bed. Just lie there and, and that's called the corpse pose, lie there and fall awake. And so why not die now, get it over with? Just fucking die. <laughs> and then the rest of your life is free. I mean, I didn't just make this up. Buckminster Fuller came to that realization when he was about to commit suicide. And he said, why don't I just die, and get it over with, then uh, ask myself the question, what is it that I, being who I am, can do that nobody else on the planet can do not being me? And just do that. And whether it fails, whether it succeeds, doesn't matter because I'm already dead. And that kind of dead is what it means to be really alive. Okay? That's why it's called the corpse pose. That's why it's said to be the hardest of all the 84,000 mainstream yoga poses. That's if you're trying. If you don't try, then you just die naturally. It's not a problem. <laughs> Ramana Maharshi did it. So I want to just, uh, now I'm building time. OK, so that's nice. There's like, uh, it's just moving from no time to more time. So <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, for this closing meditation, what I'd really like to do, well, let's just take a few moments and drop into uh, sitting. You've been sitting for a very long time. I want to actually engage in something other than sitting, uh, another door into the room. But let's just, for a moment, just rest in awareness, letting go of everything you've heard, everything that I've said, and just gentling your way into this moment, this breath, this sitting here, this being human.
And I'll uh, end this piece of it with uh, two poems, although I want to emphasize again that the meditation practice never ends. It's just like we're living our lives, we're living our way into it. And because of what Norm did and what Sonia did, I'd like to share two poems with you. Many of you have heard them because I like these poems a lot, so I use them a lot. Uh, but around the nature of the personal pronouns, uh, because we're so self-centered. This is by um, Emily Dickinson, who, you, if you're not a native English speaker, I apologize. <laughs> and if you are a native English speaker, you have to listen unbelievably carefully to her because no one ever did anything like this before or after with the English language. And think about your own wounds as you hear this and your own impulse sometimes to shun yourself or to push yourself away from yourself or to denigrate yourself or distance because you're not good enough or, you're, you didn't, you, or it's too painful to go there for whatever reason. Me, from myself to banish, had I art, impregnable my fortress unto all heart. But since myself assault me, how have I peace except by subjugating consciousness? And since we're mutual monarch, how this be except by abdication me of me. So what I want to say is don't abdicate. Integrate. Bring all the pieces of you together. That's the love affair. There's no part of you that's not worthy. There never has been. That's your Buddha nature. I mean, it's like it's beyond time and beyond space. You didn't ask for it. It's impermanent. What else is there to do on this planet except wake up and not be at war with oneself? We got more important things to do. We can't, if we're at war with ourselves and we take our own suffering personally, then we don't have a way of liberating ourselves from it. And then we can't be the we that we need to be in order to really own the body politic and bring sanity to the planet to even the tiniest little degree. I'm not talking about saving the world in the conventional way. I'm talking about healing the world. And the other poem is by Derek Walcott, who's an Afro-Caribbean um, poet who, Nobel laureate, died a few years ago, who writes very long poems. This is a short one. And it's called, the, it has a title, Love After Love. Okay, and I want to dedicate this to Sonia to the tail end of her talk. Okay, and this is in the personal. This is about me, you know, my life, but it's also a we. But we need to sometimes tune our instrument ourselves before we tune to each other. So, and we need to continually be tuning while we're playing. The time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to yourself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life who you have ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes, all of uh, Norm's stories. Peel your own image from the mirror. And then the last line is, sit, feast on your life.
So this is that feast, folks. And none of us are marginal to this engagement. None of us is here by accident. It really, truly is a love affair with wisdom, with compassion, with deep interconnectedness with our own humanity and with sentience itself, way beyond mere human beings. And with the universe, for that matter. It's so beautiful, so awe-inspiring, so unbelievable. Just the dawn in the desert with the mountains, wherever we are. Even in hell realms, they self-liberate in wakefulness and require work. So I want to, this is not the end. I'm, I'm going to propose something that will have us all standing. But before we do it, I want to sort of just say a few things to close so that uh, the energy, when it dissipates, we're not going to bring it back together. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you for your presence at this conference. Whatever mysterious impulses brought you here, because there are thousands of people who almost signed up or almost came to this conference and didn't, but you're here. And that's showing not just a tremendous initiative, but also in some sense, I would say a responsibility, that we have a responsibility to each other if we've been affected at all by anything that anybody has said or never mind said, but transmitted through their being. And it goes totally beyond success and failure. This is a non-dual enterprise. It's not about ussing and theming. If we do that, we've already created a hell realm. We don't know how to not do that because we're so good at it. But that's what's required. So I want to just thank you for your attention and, um, and um, invoke, because we're in this area, the Navajo blessing uh, that they say, may you walk in beauty. And I like to say, again, I hope you don't see it as cultural appropriation, but if you do, I'll accept it. Uh, may you walk in beauty, may we walk in beauty, and may we realize that we already do. So thank you, folks. <laughs>